Hello, let's have a quick chat, shall we, about the five things which I've come across a lot, actually, and I'm pretty sure some of you folks out there will do as well, is these five, five myths that a lot of folks seem to be under the impression of that you need to follow in order to start a model railway. I'm of the impression that actually these, these what, what appear to be the, the goalposts, if you will, what appear to be the, the standard, um, of acceptance in terms of this is what you need to do to have a model railway. I don't think they're actually true. I think it's a lot of, um, well, let's find out, shall we? Hi, up, folks. Welcome back to Iron Horse Railways and the room of the modelling of trains. So first a quick recap on last week's rantings and ramblings. We've had a lot of feedback from you folks in the community. Uh, we've heard a lot of what you've got to say about your own personal story. So thank you first and foremost for coming forward and, and sharing those experiences. Some of them were really not pleasant to read about and it's quite difficult to believe that a lot of people out there still seem to think that there isn't a problem with, with gatekeeping or with being exclusionary or being elitist. It seems to me that if you think that, then maybe you're the problem, not us. I mean, when you've got, I'm not gonna mention names, but I have had several big name YouTubers reach out, comment, high standing members of the, of the community and the industry reach out and said, you know what, well done. John over at Harold Road, he released a very heartfelt video about the subject. It's actually come close to almost making him stop modelling entirely. Al over at Dragon Junction Mark II, hasn't uploaded for a, quite a while now. He made a video stating why he's been away and guess what? It was because of all the negative comments, all of the you shouldn't do this sort of stuff. Thankfully, he's made a video, he's come back to it. And then you've, then you've got Double O Dave, who's just crackers. He's a new lad, he's, he's not been on YouTube for long, but he's already got a thousand subscribers. And he's, he's pretty funny, actually. He's a northern lad, I think. Can't quite place that accent. I want to say Derby or South Yorkshire, somewhere like that. I don't think he's a proper Yorkshire man anyway. Might be a plastic Yorkshire man. We'll have to see what we're doing, if you're watching this fella. Your sausage fingers. The weathering were alright by the way mate, that's not bad for a first attempt, well done, easy enough to do, anyone can do it. Anyway, moving on, so, obstacles and five reasons, five myths, five things that tend to stop people building a modern railway, five, not ex excuses if you will, or, no, no, not excuses, excuses is the wrong word, sort of five myths that you'll commonly come across if you're looking about how to start a model railway you'll, you'll see these in the usual places and again no name but I'm, I'm sure you can imagine where I'm talking about so I'm just going to go through a few of them with you I mean there's dozens and dozens and dozens so if you can think of any more that you've personally found please as usual let me know in the comments uh, what you're thinking guys so without further ado we'll crack on and we'll start listing this stuff off shall we Number one, you need to be a soldering expert guru. Now, that's not the case at all. If you've never picked up a soldering iron, you can absolutely get a Muller Railway built and build a damn good one as well. There's no need for you to have to solder if you don't want to. Don't get me wrong, if you can learn to solder at some point, it will help you do things a little bit easier in the long run and allow you to do certain other things. But there are companies like DCC Concepts who make pre-wired rail joiners and connecting blocks and spring-loaded connecting blocks so you never need to pick up a soldering iron to wire up your layout. All of their, well I said near enough all, all near enough all of their ancillaries and, and accessories come with um, screw block connectors so you can spare a wire, shove it in, clamp it down in either way. All their point motors work that way. I've installed dozens of them before now. They haven't had to touch the soldering iron to actually install them. And if you've got the wide rail joiners, you're good to go. And you can even buy extensions as well, so you don't need to be a soldering expert to play with your trains. Just bear that in mind. Don't listen to the page of the page of nonsense. You don't need to be able to solder to enjoy 
model railways. Next question. You need a really long, high spec, wiring power bus to run your model railway. Again, it's just not simply true. It's just simply not true. Yes, don't get me wrong. Having a proper bus feed underneath your light will, will lend itself to helping you do things like point motors and lights. But again, if you just want to connect two crocodile clips to your track and then to your power supply, not the mains AC, I'm talking about like your NCE power cab or your Sprog or whatever, like what I do, provided you're only running one or two low power trains, it will work. It won't trip any short circuits out, it won't overload anything, it won't blow anything up and melt it, it'll be absolutely fine. So again, the myth that you need to have a really complex, long bus wire of certain gauge wire, it's fine, honestly, you don't need to do it. But I will say this, it will benefit you if you do. So don't let that stop you either. Next question, O gauge or no gauge, quite often the bigger scales are seen as the more authentic scales. And that I found can put a lot of people off from entering the hobby, because let's face it, not everyone's got enough room to have a, a, a huge double O layout going around the loft or spare bedroom or whatever. And you might not just want a humble four foot long HO or double O shunting layout. And if you want O gauge, you might not even have room in your garden for it. So then you're forced to look at the smaller scales. A double O gauge can also be seen as the children's scale because home we do things like the railroad range and they're a little bit more robust, a bit cheaper, a bit more affordable. But that again is not the case. Do not let the internet goblins put you off. Not wrong with double O, certainly not wrong with railroad if you're just starting out. Even if you're not starting out, you can high, high detail them. And there's loads of companies like Western Wagon Works do a range of fantastic little bits and pieces for super detailing. Most modern diesels these days anyway. So there's no excuses for not having a go. You can crack on with it. There's loads of videos out there how to fit lights to them as well. So again, don't be frightened of the cheaper stuff. Don't be frightened of the second hand stuff. And honestly, don't be frightened of N-Gage. There are a few things you need to bear in mind with N-Gage. You have to clean the track a little bit more because it's quite tiny and small. But other than that, really, it works just as well as double O. And you can fit a lot more in the scale than with double O or O gauge. But I would say, no. Don't listen to the people that say you need to have double O gauge because you won't be able to see N-Gage because you're failing eyesight or fidelity issues. It's not something I've had an issue with. I know plenty of modelers in advanced years, uh, 60, 70, 80 years old, that still enjoy thoroughly modeling and engage, and even Z scale, which is really small. So again, don't let scale, or rather lack of scale, put you off from having your model railway. You can play trains with us, get involved. Next question, you need at least a six by eight board to have a model railway on. Well, that's just not true, is it? Let's be honest, I mean, look behind you. None of my railways are six by eight. That's four foot. That's six foot long by two foot. This is two foot by 10 foot. Um, my previous layout was, I think I've had one at four foot by three foot. It doesn't matter. If you want a double O gauge or O gauge continuous run round your round your loop, you can actually squeeze it into if you are willing to compromise on the length of the rolling stock. You can actually fit a continuous run in a two foot uh, length, if you will. Mike over at Budget Modern Railways has done it plenty of times. And there's even people that have managed to have it with radius one curves, which is less than two foot. So again, if you're willing to compromise slightly on the roll, the stock and the locos that you run, you can actually have a baseboard less than six foot eight. You, again, this is another myth from the internet goblins. You don't need a six by eight massive board as a minimum, you really don't. A windowsill will be enough. This windowsill for me is eight inches deep by, I would say five foot. And you could put an N gauge on there. You could even put a HO or double O end to end shunting diorama on there. Something that most of the time you just sit there and look at your train and you go, they're, they're lovely models. I'm happy with the scene I've built. And every now and again, you pick it up and you have a little bit of a shunt. You might move a wagon round. Don't just pick it up. Use the locomotive for what it was designed for. Locomoting, locomoting, I don't know, Move, moving on, moving on. You'll find it easier if you focus on a specific era or a specific time period or location when you build your model railway. 
again, this just really isn't an absolute necessity. Yes, don't get me wrong. There are some fantastic models out there that are set in a very specific time period or a very specific location. And it's apparent when you look at them, nothing wrong with that. But again, if you're just starting out, you don't need to panic about where your model railway is set or what time period it is. If, um, again, we had this conversation last week, but if you want to run just where you're setting up a HST with freight wagons, which technically speaking, these days you could do because Rail Adventure do it. They've got the back-to-back -back power cars now uh, pulling freight. So, yeah, HST's pulling freight. Who'd have thought it? Prototypical. There you are. So, you can do it, and you do not need to focus on having that specific era, specific time period. Just relax and enjoy what your model railway can bring to you. But do bear in mind, it can be really fun. And I'm speaking of experience here, trying to think of a location or an era. And rather than doing it to the letter, try and make it evocative of the area, area or area. A bit like a, an impression, artist's impression of, um, of, of the area. So for example, if you're doing Festiniog, for example, it doesn't need to look just like Balan Festiniog, but you might have a couple of narrow gauge engines, a couple of stone sheds, and maybe one or two key features from that area. So people can go, ah, oh, that's supposed to be Festiniog or a narrow gauge railway in Wales. People will fill the gaps in. And I can't remember who said it. I think it was Charlie over at Chadwick Model Railway. If it wasn't you, Charlie, I do apologise, but I'm fairly sure they said it was something along the lines of, it's just somewhere to hang your imagination off of. And I couldn't agree more with that. Again, nothing wrong with being prototypical. There's nothing technically even wrong with rivet counting. And that wasn't the issue of last week, by the way. Rivet counting's fine. It's just when you start getting elitist about it and shunning people that don't see ITR, ITR with you in terms of explicit detail. But anyway, we've done that. We're not going back into it. Just somewhere to hang the old imagination. Get involved. You can do it. Right, I think I've rambled on long enough there for one episode, folks. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to leave you with this week's modelling updates. Don't forget to leave a comment down below if this is all you're interested in seeing. That's fine. Thanks for stopping by. The rest of you that want to see the modelling updates, stick around. They're coming up now. I'll see you soon, guys. Cheers. Bye-bye. We've started to get some progress now with the engine shed. I've installed the internal platform. It's a little bit far away from the locos and the wagons. Quite a big gap uh, between the rail, but you know, it is what it is. It wasn't designed to fit there, but you know, everything works. So it does the job nicely. I've bedded it in so there's no ugly seam between the model and the uh, the baseboard now so it actually looks part of the landscape same with the ramp as well which i'm still not crazy about but I, you know i made it myself from a bit of foam and some card so i think once to get some weathering on there and a few um, people and what have you it'll look good but now moving to this bit's embankment bit here so i've installed the bridge i'm going to leave the internals of the tunnel mouth uh, empty just so I can access any trains that might derail and then this bit open as well but the whole point of this is is this entire section just lifts out so I can lift it out get to anything underneath it but what I'm going to do is we're going to scenic all this make it an embankment and then at the bottom of it we're going to put a fencing in so that sort of separates the embankment from the yard down here. I'm also going to have this section of retaining wall removable as well, whereas the rest of it will be fixed in place, just so I can get an access to the. There's a a point motor behind there, so just in case anything goes wrong with it, I will be able to get access to it without you know, having to rip everything up and destroy everything. So I think the next job, realistically, is we're just going to start adding some scenery to this. But first things first is put a shell over it 
I'm going to use a mix of PVAJ cloths and some of the old blue towel as well and that's just going to go into all these gaps and it's just going to give the impression of landscape once that's been done it's a case of scatter over the top so we'll check that in once that's been done easy enough and with a swipe of my hand so we're going to scenic this area now this bit is stationary and this bit's removable and i'm making like an embankment so i said before the embankment's going to go here with a fence to simulate the end of the yard and there's going to be some detritus and overgrowth trip down here but the first thing i'm doing is just wetting the area with neat pva and all this has been painted with a layer of pva too we don't want it too wet at the minute because of the next step and all i've got down here is a mix of pva and water so it's nice and runny this is a lot runnier than the stuff i used the neat pva i used and all i want to do is take some of this blue roll so i'm just roughly putting it in in place and we'll have several layers of this stuff as well and we're doing like a, a paper mache thing Got a little bit of an overlay at the top there just a little bit that's it that's it and again this will all look like ground once it's done and if you've got it to hand which of course i don't here we are little bottle filled with just water just gently spray it just to wet it down into place and that'll do one of two jobs now when we get our brush which of course i have misplaced because i always do this pick i'll just put it down for a second and of course the little pixies have had it away haven't they funnily, funnily enough i left it there in the bloody thing <laughs> what an idiot so get your moist and brush and just put the pva on like that. and what you're doing is you're sticking the paper down with the PVA, see how it's sort of like matting it in. That's what we want. That's what we want, just like that. And I know at the minute it looks like a hot, sticky mess. That's because it is. But once we're finished with this, and we've taken our time with it, it will create a nice. First of all, it will strengthen the piece, and it will create a nice little bit of undulation in the scenery. Because once this is static grass or flocked or what have you. A bit more PVA on there, it'll look a lot better. Nothing ever looks good when it's half finished, does it? So, I'm just going to finish off doing this because it's quite boring to watch, it's not rocket science. Once I've done that, I've got a few more layers on it, we'll move on to putting some fancy flock on there. Oh, so what we've done again, we've just put a little bit in there just to fill it really. We've bridged in the gap on the tunnel mouth there, and I've just folded back the excess. Paper. This is still one sheet of paper, by the way. Um, I think we can get away with just the one. Yeah, I could do two or three more, but it's it's not going to be handled. And all I've done now is mixed up some brown, um, a little bit of burnt sienna, burnt umber, sorry, and a bit of black to make it a nice dark brown. And then we're just going to paint it, paint it, and blend it in. Then we're going to get some flock on there, and that should hopefully make it look a little bit more like. Um, the scenery after it. I've also mixed in a little bit of the PVA water just to make the paint a little bit more sticky. There we go. Now I know on the camera it looks black but if I get the light right you can just see the brown and that's just to cover it so if, if any like scenery falls off it doesn't show through straight away. So I'm going to get some basic ground cover on there and then layer it with the woodland scenic stuff back in this bottle so I can put more on top of it and hopefully I can get the impression of overgrowth on bushes and hedges and all of you right then it's the day after a couple of days later actually new class 17 by the way spreading in and what i've done i've actually added some static grass to the embankment now as well as some other flock and what have you try to get the impression of a little bit of overgrowth on top of this wall there and i think we've done i think we've done a passable job really it's not too bad at all I've not used a static grass applicator that is just with a a ballast bottle funnily enough with the with some holes just on the top of it and just giving it a good shaking it's two millimeter grass so it's worked pretty well 
I'm happy with that. Class 17 bedding in there. And of course we've got down here, I put some more static grass on the embankment there and it's just given, especially on the top, it's just given it a little bit more in the way of depth. And uh, I do think it might be time to actually invest in a proper static grass applicator. So I quite like that, I've got to be honest with you. I was surprised at the difference just like one one or two coatings of basic static grass makes. I've always been a traditional flock kind of guy, but I think this this might be the way forward. Of course it's end scale so you don't want it too high in real I mean in reality, two millimeter long grass in end scale is gonna be a foot long. So that's twelve a twelve inch long piece of grass, essentially. So you gotta bear that in mind. But apart from that, I'm liking it. Now that's probably gonna be it in terms of seeing it work this week. But I'll see if there's anything else that pops up and let you know if I do.